to Skyward Broadside. Take to the skies and battle it out in this multiplayer team deathmatch. Lock on to any opponent in your sight to aim your cannons with ease or manually for more expert play. Fly through the cartoon cel-shaded environment using the beautiful and fully destructible terrain to your advantage. Whether you want to break an opponent's line of sight or just break an opponent, these islands are key to strategic play. But be careful, as unruly pirates have set up hostile outposts that will attack anyone who gets too close. Best destroy those quickly for your own safety and your team's victory. Don't worry too much about the local flora, I'm sure it'll recover. Choose between one of our three custom airships, each with their own look, feel, and most importantly, weaponry. Each ship gets a set of standard cannonballs to deal some damage, or switch to a powerful explosive variety to really get your point across. Make sure to watch your ammo though. If you're caught with your pants down, your airship will follow them soon after. The Sky Scalpel may be fragile, but its homing missiles pack a punch. The Steel Skybird's Gatling Gun teaches any foe not to come too close, though you will need a real cannonball to finish the job. What can I say, folks? We build our airships sturdy. The Behemoth is the sturdiest ship in the fleet, with its physics-based shockwave ammo letting you stake your claim on the sky. Play for the Order of the Guard or the Sky Rats. Should your allegiances shift, you can even change your mind. Don't worry, we won't tell. But how did we make this? The first thing you will notice when you play is the graphics and art style. We created a cell shader to give our game a cartoon style look. Unity does not provide pre-calculated brightness, so all our 3D geometry uses our own Fong lighting model, which gives similar results to Unity's standard shading. Once we have a lighting value between 0 and 1, we can restrict said values. This process is called cell shading, as it mimics how lighting is drawn by hand on animation cells. A separate version was made for the player ship to allow for alpha testing. This prevents your ship from obstructing your line of sight. To really sell the cartoon look and help distinguish islands from one another, we used an outline shader. We tried approaches like drawing black if the surface normal is close enough to perpendicular with the camera, or a second shader pass with an enlarging vertex shader that draws black. However, due to how our models was made, this wouldn't let us center the outline and was made worse by the process we used to make the islands. In the end, a post-process effect was used, which tests the depth texture on and around a given pixel. Should the differences be too much, it draws black. This accomplishes our goal of helping the player distinguish detail up close. UI elements were hand-drawn and given animations and shaders. This helps them distinguish themselves from the more simple-looking cell-shaded environment, and also helps the player immediately read data off them, letting them direct more focus towards the chaotic gameplay. This helps it become immediately visible to the player. We took this idea further with the terrain and players. We changed how we made the islands, restricting ourselves to only four consistent bright colours, which helps our islands pop and lends itself well to the cell shader. The industry convention for player teams is to have red and blue, however the blue team would blend into the water and sky at a distance. Yellow and purple was chosen as they are complementary colours and contrast well against other in-game objects. The water was made with a very small water texture that we tiled, and a noise texture of a different size. We used the value of that noise to offset the UV coordinate, with the brightness controlling how up right or down left we look. By scrolling these textures in two different directions, we get animated water. Thanks to the textures being different sizes, we can hide the tiling, and due to the displacement even very small textures can be upscaled to match the resolution of the display. Clouds are essential for any game in the skies, and we knew we didn't want ours to look like solid models. We decided to procedurally generate them, creating 3D noise in a compute shader and then building the cloud's mesh, only placing geometry where the noise is high enough. A fall off texture was applied on top to prevent sharp edges on the cloud. Originally we used spheres placed in a grid for our clouds. This caused too many draw calls, resulting in poor frame times. Even with GPU instancing, WebGL builds could not handle the number of vertices. We remedied this by creating a single mesh made of quads instead, which we would have face the camera no matter what the direction. There was literature on making models always face the screen online. This process is called billboarding, however there is no information on how to apply this billboarding effect to separate parts of a model. We accomplished this by storing data in the RGB and UV channels of the vertices. This let us use the real positions of the vertices to prevent Unity from culling the model. We would transform vertices into view space using the position stored in the RGB values. Once there, any XY movement corresponds directly to XY movement on the player's screen. We could then rebuild the quad and project to screen space. Our other key technology was our fully destructible environment. Completely dynamic destruction was unfeasible due to its high computational requirements. Instead, we used a Blender plugin to generate some rock shapes which we can merge together to form the shape we want. 
we can then use another plugin called Cell Fracture, which breaks the island up into multiple parts. Each of these can then be assigned a breakable component that listens for collision or nearby explosions. This lets us have fully destructible floating islands without any complex computation. Despite all islands being floating, scenes like this, where the remains of an arch are floating with no support, do not feel right to players. Almost destroyed islands feel wrong too, and having too many physics objects resting in craters can harm performance. Therefore, we created what we call the Cascade System in order to address this. We split the islands into grids of cascade cells, shown in different colours in this image. We then treat this as a graph, with empty cells being non-traversable. Buoyancy points are placed in 3D space into the object, which tag that given cell as buoyant. Destroying part of the island triggers surrounding cascade cells to perform a breadth-first search on this graph, trying to find a buoyancy point. If it can't, it crumbles. As they have exhausted their reachable part of the graph too, no cell in that part would be buoyant, thus it crumbles all searched cells as well. Conversely, if it can find a buoyancy point, all searched cells could also find one, and so are added to a safe set. On all subsequent searches this update, a cell can first check if it has already been broken, put in this safe set, or if it must search the graph. This lets us keep our explosive weaponry in the game without losing any performance. Originally, we had every breakable synced across the network to get around Unity's non-deterministic physics. However, should networking latency become an issue, this would fall apart. It also uses a lot of network traffic itself. In the end, we scrapped the system and only synchronised what broke, with the force and in what direction. This lets destruction remain deterministic, with only some small errors in how the island fragments will fall. Ultimately, our achievement is making a graphically striking game with a dynamic, physics-based world that can run smoothly even while on the web.